Thank you. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see you this morning. I'm so glad you're here, whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us online. I hope that this morning is a time for you to feel your soul lifted up into the presence of God as we worship and sing and pray and listen together. This is the first Sunday of Lent. I kind of keep laughing at myself because last year for Lent, I said we're going to do this big reflection on the last year and think about what it's meant to us. And, you know, because we're almost over <laughs> this. And here we are a year later uh, after another year of being in the midst of this pandemic and riding the waves of that. But as we come into Lent in these 40 days, it really is a time of stripping away. And we think about Jesus going into the desert for 40 days and, and what that was like and, and what you might need to leave behind or clear out or begin to practice to make more space. And so after the last couple of years that have been, I think, a stripping away for many of us, it's a good time to reflect on the ways that we've changed, on the the practices that we may have developed over the last two years that we want to let go of, things that we want to continue in, ways we want to keep moving forward into being the people that we are called to be. And the first step of that is to be authentic. And so that's how we enter this space of Lent. A few announcements. Uh, this coming Tuesday evening, uh, 7 o'clock on Zoom, uh, I'll be hosting a friend of mine, um, Professor Samuel Goda. Sam is a Slovakian um, scholar and peacemaker who specializes in the Ukraine. And so he's offered to meet with us on Zoom on Tuesday to talk about what's going on, to offer his perspective, offer us ways to help. Uh, he's currently studying at UC Berkeley. So uh, there's information here and online. And so please join us online on Tuesday evening. And um, on Tuesday morning, I'll be hosting a Lenten morning prayers. So at 7.30 in the morning, you're welcome uh, to join me with your coffee, and we'll just have about a half hour of morning prayers during this season of Lent to, uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, this is, I would say, probably the last day. If you're interested in the women's retreat next weekend, we'd love to have you. So women, please uh, consider signing up. It's going to be a really fantastic weekend. We're getting excited. We'll be mostly based here in the sanctuary and in Portola Valley with a, a trip over to Half Moon Bay um, on, the after, on Saturday afternoon. So please consider joining us for that. We'd love to have you. I'm really grateful for everyone who's participating in worship today to have Ezra, Sarah, and Barbary leading our music and to have Flint Mitchell speaking. Flint grew up here at VPC and uh, he's written a beautiful book that we'll have for sale after uh, the service. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you soon. But as we begin, let's take a deep breath to move our souls from the busyness of getting here to the openness of being here. Inviting God to be with us as we worship. May our hearts be open and be moved by our time this morning. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to use our introit time to kind of learn our opening hymn. It's not in your hymnals, but the words are printed in your bulletin. And we'll line it out um, so that you have a chance to learn it and you'll be all ready to go after the call to worship. So the, um, we got a little ambitious with printing the words. We're not actually even going to touch that third stanza, so don't worry about it. Uh, the first part has echoes built in, so I'll sing it and ask you to sing it back to me. Worship and bow down 
and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. We'll do that again. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Now the next part, this is our God. We sing all that together, but while we learn it, I'll sing it first and ask Sarah to lead you all in the repetition of it. This is our God. This is our God. This is our God. This is our God. My turn. We are the people of God's pasture. This is our God, this is our God, this is our God, this is our God. We are the sheep of God's hand, we are the sheep of God's hand. And then we repeat from the top. Come, let us worship and bow down. And kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. God, you are present here, whether we recognize you or not, whether we acknowledge you or not. You are present within us, between us, and around us. Your Holy Spirit is holding us in being, and the energy of your love suffuses the universe. May we become aware of your presence in this space and time, aware of your heartbeat of love, aware of your longing for us. Speak to us through stillness and silence, through music and word. Give us grace to listen and to hear you in the depths of ourselves. Amen. Now please stand and join in singing, Come Let Us Worship and Bow Down.
let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. Be seated. We come to our time of confession and we bring our whole selves, knowing that we are safe to be our authentic selves with God. So would you join me in this prayer? Abiding God, you know the best in us. You know the worst in us. Your love for us remains steadfast, unchanging, and resolute. Be our rock, our refuge, as we dare to look at our deepest selves. God of change, you know what we can be. You know what needs to change in us. Your call to us remains constant, open, and dynamic. Be our guide and helper now. God of transformation, you know we find it hard to change. You know we easily revert to old patterns, old ways. Hold us now in our longing to grow. Renew in us your vision of what we might become. I invite you to just a moment of silence and maybe just playing with your fists a little bit to, to open and clench and release and and consider what you may be holding tightly and what you'd like to release in the presence of God this morning. We hear the voice of God saying to us, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not see it? Oh God, we open ourselves to what you are opening in us that is new, new pathways of courage, of authenticity, of compassion, of wholeness. Maybe listen to your voice and follow your leading into the new life you are always working within us. Amen. Would you join me in the, the prayer of response in your bulletin? Friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and free. Amen. It's such a gift. Um, when we can let the things we're holding on to go to be in the presence of another. And so this is the moment in which we pass the peace of Christ to each other. So I'll invite you in just a moment to stand and greet each other. Peace of Christ be with you. Let us peace. Peace of Christ be with you. This is grass with everybody. Hi, Jefferson. Hi, outside. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh. Good morning, everyone. And hi, Bonita, taking hi. your bicycle ride. <laughs> yes, I'm just getting started on it this time, but it's so beautiful to be with you all. And how is Jay doing? All. How is Jay doing, Bonita? He's doing a He's he's doing okay, not great, not terrible. Just uh, able to participate, but not get out very much. Um, do a little bit. So. Well, you're I, 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 Thank you. The song of invitation this morning is "Take Me as I Am." 
number 698. We'll sing through it three times. morning. Our scripture reading today is Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 13. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and afterwards Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, since you are God's son, command the stone to be turned into a loaf of bread. And Jesus replied, it is written, people won't only live by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil then brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. And Jesus answered, it has been said, don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. A few months ago, I started seeing on uh, Trish Mitchell's social media feed that uh, she was so proud of her son and this amazing book he was writing. And, um, and I was so excited when Flint reached out to me and said he'd love to come and share that with us here at Valley and listed off the people in this place that have influenced him and um, helped him write this uh, beautiful, beautiful book. And I've been reading it the last few weeks, and uh, it always challenges me. Um, it's a good book for us to read during Lent because I think it's really inviting us to live uh, the life that we are called to be, to, to clean out the things that, that are in our way. And um, I'm just so grateful for your wisdom, Flint, and um, for bringing that um, into the world in your book, and congratulations on finishing that. And so we're so excited to, to be with you this morning, so thanks Thank for you. being here. Would you welcome Flint with me? Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. So if you are not familiar with me, I grew up uh, not too far from here in Menlo Park and grew up coming to Valley Presbyterian Church. Uh, I think it would be tough to separate my own personal self-development as an individual from the experiences that I had here growing up. Um, one example of that is actually the uh, 
book is dedicated partly to Barbara Varenhorst, who was, as you all know, a, a dear angel of this, this church. Um, so just for some brief context of why I'm up here talking about authenticity is a couple years ago, 2019, I set off on a, a fairly exciting adventure where I spent about a year searching for surf and good hiking up and down the coast, uh, the west coast of North America, Hawaii, and eventually Australia. Uh, six months of it was sleeping in the back of my van that I retrofitted with a little uh, bed. And then the other months were just kind of with a backpack on my, on my back and a surfboard in hand. Um, and while I was on this adventure, I had a, a significant writing project that was supposed to be entirely for myself. It was a series of essays. Each essay was uh, about a specific value. So values like integrity or responsibility or gratefulness. Um, it was really a declaration to myself of what I thought to be important to me, for me, so that in the future, after 25 years old, I could kind of come back to those things if I was wavering off the, uh, off the path. And when the coronavirus pandemic struck, I was in Australia about a month uh, after it had struck here. It was kind of an interesting uh, contrast talking to my, my parents saying everything was shut down and I was sleeping in espresso on the side of a beach. Um, and the next day I was flying back to San Francisco. And when I came back, since I was intending to just continue traveling west until my bank account was dry, uh, I had a, a month or two runway to finish this project. So I spent that time uh, deliberately editing, editing it for 10 or so hours a day, just making sure it was what I wanted. And I, I finally put the, the period at it at the end of it. Uh, and it was at that moment that I realized I couldn't actually not share it. Uh, it's one thing to write a book for yourself. It's another thing to not share it with the people around you. And after some dramatically positive feedback, it uh, snowballed into this larger project, which eventually I published last December. And uh, the purpose of these essays was originally supposed to be a declaration to myself of why these values were important to me. But what ended up happening was through the literature that I was reading uh, and the philosophy and history that I dove into, it became more of an interrogation of these ideas as opposed to a declaration of their importance. It was more a, a what are these values as opposed to why are they important to me? Um, and I, I say that as a, uh, or I say that framework because I don't believe this is self-help. It was never intended to be advice for anyone or even really for myself. It was just, what are these things that we think are so important? Because they clearly are important. We're constantly talking about things like integrity, or responsibility, or gratefulness being important in our lives. So why are they important? And as I was diving into this, this topic, this one concept was both a value in itself, but also I found patterns of it appearing in all the other values. And that was this concept of authenticity. Uh, I've pretty much always been dissatisfied with the word because uh, if you think of all the times that you're being told to be authentic or that your brand should be authentic or um, you know, how, and how are we supposed to be authentic, it kind of feels like we're being beaten over the head by the word, like it's constantly being used. And the way that it's defined is uh, be genuine. Well, that's defining a word with another word. Or they'll say, be true to yourself which is a really pretty way of saying nothing. In my opinion, once again, this is, it's, this is all my opinion, you know, take it as you will. Um, and so I set out after I uh, created a, a series of notes for these, these essays to really interrogate this idea of authenticity. Can I come up with a definition for it? And can I create some sort of metric? As an engineer or a scientist early in uh, my career, I like to have measurements for things and data and analyze things like that. And so I was like, in my life, is there any way where I can measure the authenticity? Uh, and so I came up with this definition of the word, which if you resonate with this, maybe this book is up your alley. Um, authenticity is the consolidation of all that you believe to be important, so your values, exhibited in your actions in the real world. So it's one thing to think certain values are important, like integrity. It's another thing to act them out in the real world. It doesn't really matter if you think honesty is important if you go around lying to everyone, right? 
And so the exhibition of all of these values, it's an amalgam of all of them, is what kind of constitutes this idea of authenticity in your own life. I was fairly happy with that definition. It's in the book. <laughs> um, but I realized that but wait, there's some truth in it. Like, I think that if you take a, a pen and a piece of paper and you write down all your, all your values, or a, a handful of them, and you rate, the, rate them one through 10, add them up and average them, you'll get a general feeling of how authentic you're being as a human being right now. Unfortunately, that didn't capture the entirety of the word. I think it has some truth in it, it feels right, but it doesn't really do it entirely, uh, justice entirely. And I, I spent some time trying to think about why that is. Why is it that we can define all these different words and these emotions, but not this concept of authenticity? Um, and what I realized is that this metric that I was using um, is just one component of the entire, very, or the entire system. So if authenticity is this overarching concept, it's built up by a series of different components. One of them is how you act out in the real world your values. But the other side is intangible because it's more of a feeling. It's the uh, reaction that you have to authentic people or authentic environments, uh, which isn't necessarily or which doesn't necessarily have a definition that you can put um, to it because the way that you react to a situation is dependent on who you are as an individual and your individual lens and how you see the world. And this idea was really why, it is at the heart of why I consider this book to be uh, a tangent of transcendentalism philosophy of the philosophers of uh, Emerson and Thoreau, which was in transcendentalism, they found truth they found almost the basis for their spirituality through their connection to nature. And it wasn't that it was their actions onto nature, and it wasn't necessarily just nature in itself, but it was the actual interaction between the two. It is not that I pick up a piece of trash off of the beach, and that is my interaction. It is not that the piece of trash is picked up off the beach. It is now the connection that is formed between me and the beach, just like uh, a action of honesty. If you are honest with another person, it is not just that you are authentic because you have been honest, but the trust formed and the trust given by the other person is the reaction. And the space in between those two things is where that power of authenticity lies. It is the substance of this, of this word or this concept. And something came to my mind uh, when I was thinking about this this morning, which I reflected on a sermon by Mark uh, Goodman Morris a decade or so ago, which was he was speaking about the cross, uh, the stained glass cross, and the reflection of it uh, on the back here. And his comment was that, or one of the elements of this comment was that the cross alone is beautiful, and the reflection of the cross is beautiful, but the space in between is really where the impact comes from. It's this incredibly special, um, important place for all of us to come together. And so it is the in-between of the action and the reaction that we find the power that we associate with this word. Because once again, authenticity is important, regardless of how maybe overused it, the concept is. We find truth in it, and we find like an emotional connection to this word or this idea. And the reason I bring this up is because as we continue to tie ourselves into the world through our positive actions, we may also realize that there isn't just truth in positive actions or positive emotions and reactions, but also negative ones. And this is where I promised I would tie it back into Lent. I promised I won't turn this into a naive philosophical lecture. The concept of something being important because of its emotional weight is important because it, things that are negative, anxiety, fear, depression, guilt, can also have truth in them. They can also have um, an, opportunity, an opportunity for us to find direction. And the way I tie this into Lent is with Lent, one of the ways that we tend to celebrate um, the, the act of going out and fasting for 40 days and, uh, of Jesus is we tend to try to sacrifice certain components of our life. We simplify for the time being and we create space in our lives. And I find this a really interesting dilemma in the sense of we are doing a very positive thing that we know is positive or we feel is positive rather. 
the act of creating space in our life or simplifying taking negative habits out of our life seems to be inherently positive, right? If you were watching TV six hours a day every day, it'd probably be better for you, most likely, to, to eliminate that habit or lower that habit. And that seems to be just true. But the act of doing that is actually a fairly negative experience. The act of creating space in your life can be anxiety provoking. Even, and, and this is true for many different things, it could actually be fasting. You, if you eliminate your lunchtime during the day, you are creating space. You're probably creating a bit of hunger. You're creating these negative sensations that you are then going to have to spill that space with something else. Um, and that's where this is important is when you create space, there are a variety of ways that you can then fill that space. And that's the message that I kind of want to try to purvey today, which once again, isn't advice. Uh, it's just merely my reflection on these topics. If you identify a foundation of values, these things that you prioritize, whether it's integrity for some people, or compassion for others, love, connection, gratefulness, responsibility for your actions, resilience, uh, mental resilience, you can then create a basis upon which you find actions or people or projects or environments that grow out of them to then fill those spaces. And it's most likely going to be a more beneficial way of filling that space. You're more, more likely, I think, once again, just me, I think that if you find space in your life or if you create space in your life, if you celebrate Lent by doing that, you may find that by filling that space with your values or with actions that resonate, stem from those values, you might be better off. Thanks. Um, There will be uh, 50 books for sale uh, that I've donated to the church, and I don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, Jenny will, will mention it. Um, and all of the proceeds from these books will go back to the church and the youth group. So um, we'd love if you guys bought a copy or two, and yeah. Thank you, Flint. Yeah, so uh, there's an envelope in the back, buy the books, and you're welcome to, to put money in that, and uh, all of the that we'll collect will go to our Next Gen Ministries to continuing to make space for other kids um, as they grow up in this, in this church. Um, or you can, if you would like to put something in the offering, just uh, designate it for Next Gen, and we'll um, take care of it that way. Um, otherwise, uh, we invite you to give to, to making space in the world for people to live in the way of Jesus in these values that are so deeply important uh, as our offering is taken. Um, you can give online or in the back as you leave today. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarah. After uh, two years of four adults and two dogs living in our smallish house, I noticed a few weeks ago that we had gotten into a habit of just leaving workbooks and mail on our table. <laughs> and there was always just a pile of things on the kitchen table. So I took it on myself one weekend to just clean it off. and. Chris and I woke up the next morning and we kind of just looked at that table and we thought, wow, that makes the whole house feel different when you wake up to a table that's clear. And I think that's a really beautiful metaphor for us during Lent to think about what are the, what are the ways we've just kind of started not cleaning things up, leaving this here or that there, and how do we begin to, to clear the table, not, not just for our own selves, but also in service of others, because certainly this world needs tables that are clean and ready to receive and ready for good conversation. This last week, uh, David White, who many of you know is a favorite poet of mine, posted a poem um, on reflection of a different kind of table. Uh, the table that we've seen in the photos with um, Putin on one end and Emmanuel Macron on the other and about, I don't know, 12 or 15 feet between them. And so I'd like to begin our communion with this poem. It's called, Here is No Table Long Enough. One man's unspoken inner edge of darkness, unconfronted and untransformed, sitting far away in his own fear, like someone looking through the wrong end of a child's telescope, like someone sitting at the end of an absurdly lengthened table, holds his intimate circle in fear of death and torture, threatens their families, poisons their lives along with his enemies, sews everyone into the straitjacket of a mobile fear, then carefully tailors a uniform of death for every single one of his bullied young men to wear. I want to pause and just say we're bringing to this table this morning also heavy hearts for what's happening in this world, and I wanted to take a moment to just name that. 
continues. May we see then in this allegory, as we too in this time sit so far away, the simple way an individual life, no matter how imprisoned, transformed by generosity, saves so many lives in the future. May we take the time while we confront this fear now on the outside with necessary and courageous physical action to preempt any future evil by bringing every hidden edge into the light, by bringing our inner troubles into the conversation, where heads are allowed to lean close to one another at a table shortened to the point of mutual understanding. There is no table long enough to keep us from our own unspoken darkness. But thanks be to God and every power beyond us, there is no table long enough to hold the riches of darkness transformed, to hold the wine raised and the bread consumed, to hold every item of our shared bounty brought from every field of our endeavor in a promised future that despite ourselves, will always be destined to forgiveness. So let us come to this table committed to being transformed by generosity. Would you read this invitation with me in your bulletin? God is with us. We are not alone. Lift up your hearts. Up to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We come to this table remembering that everyone is welcome at this table. This table is long enough for all of us. We remember how how Jesus was with his friends on the night that he was betrayed. On that night where the table seemed very long and dark, and there was much to forgive. And he took bread, and he broke it, and he offered it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, of a new way of being. Drink. Be transformed. Join into this new covenant and this new way of being. And so we do that. We make those promises. We enter into that life every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup in a world that so desperately needs to share a table. If you're at home, we invite you to grab something to eat and drink. If you have not gotten a little cup today and you would like one here, please raise your hand and an usher will bring it to you. And before we eat, let's pray together. Oh God, we offer you all of our hidden edges, the places where we are hiding from truth, the ways in which we are not aligning with our values, places that we're not sure that even you can transform. We bring all of that to you this morning, holding in one hand our own lives, even as we are concerned and brokenhearted for the situation playing out in our world by the capacity for violence and war and misunderstanding. May we be transformed by generosity so that we can be those who transform our world through generosity. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our God who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you that you fill us and give us what we need to live this life in the way that you have called us to be the people that you have created us to be. We trust you as we move forward into this week. Amen. A few notes. Um, I'm told that uh, we have a visitor from Australia on the call this morning, so... 
you can wave to the cameras and say hi to Carrie. Um, <laughs> she's been working remotely, organizing our children's ministry team, and we miss you, and we're so glad you're with us this morning. And uh, for those of you also who are online, who may want to um, want one of Flint's books, you will have them here um, for the next couple of weeks, so you're welcome to drop it by. And if you'd like to donate um, on the pull-down menu on the website, you can just put to Jimmy's Eagle Scout Fund, and that will go to our Next Gen Ministries so, um, to help with the new playground that Jimmy just finished. So I think that's a great way for you to give if you're online. So let's uh, stand together and sing this beautiful song. The lyrics are written by a uh, recently passed uh, Des Archbis Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Goodness is Stronger Than Evil, hymn number 750. just take those lyrics and kind of like emblazon them somewhere this week where you can just see them every day and let that song resonate in your hearts and minds as you go into this week seeking to live a life that is authentic as we do so in the power and name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm. 